neither decline from the words of my mouth. I mean, whenever God spoke, that's the truth. That's the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That's the final word on a matter whenever God speaks. And you and I are not to decline from His words. You know, I see all the time, I see Christians who do pretty well and they seem like they gain them, sometimes even in leaps and bounds. Sometimes they're like the man in Acts chapter 3 who leaped and walked and praised God. Sometimes it just seemed like, boy, I mean, they just really get going. They get off to a flying start. And brother, all of a sudden, they'll do what God tells them to do. And they begin to grow and grow and grow. And all of a sudden, man, looks like there's somebody. I mean, God's going to do a work. God can do something with that person because, man, I mean, they, they are moving ahead. But all of a sudden, they hit a snag. All of a sudden, it seemed like something just kind of waylays them. All of a sudden, it seemed like something comes in and stunts their growth. And it seems like once that growth is stunted, it seems like then the next thing you notice is back down we go. All of a sudden, it seems like as though that they're going up that ladder and going up and next thing you know, back down they come. And you know, that's not very good. That Bible says, decline not for my sayings. You and I are supposed to incline. You and I are supposed to be gaining on the thing all the time. You and I ought to be filling ourselves more and more with the Word of God all the time. You and I ought to be getting some things in order in our life more all the time. And you and I ought to incline our ear and incline our heart towards the Word of God, not decline, I mean, from the Word of God, from the sayings of God, because when you do, you're not improving anything, my friend. You are hurting yourself. You are falling. You're stumbling. You're about to take a tumble. You're about to fall. You're about to be smashed on the rocks. What God says is so, and you don't decline from His sayings. Down here in verse number 21 where we begin to read, that Bible says, Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. You know what you and I are supposed to do if we're going to keep our heart with all diligence? We're supposed to go to the Word of God, spend enough time in the Word of God to be full of the Word of God, and so much so that we have good portions of the Word of God retained on the inside, not decline from them, and keep them in the midst of our heart. You know that's not easy to do? You know you can't take the Word of God and get a whole bunch of the Word of God and get in the midst of your heart and retain it and keep it there? Without a constant inflow and without using the Word of God? Why listen, there are times that I find whenever I run a little bit slack as far as my Bible reading is concerned, all of a sudden I'll know where a verse is, I'll know where it's at, I'll almost know where it's at, just about, and I can't put my hand, my hand on it. I just about know where it's at. You know what you and I should do? You and I should take the Word of God seriously. You and I should take the Word of God and fill ourselves with it. And you and I should be so concerned about the Word of God that you and I fill ourselves with it and keep it in the midst of our heart. You know what that takes? That takes constant work. That Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Let me ask you this, 1985 is about to end. Let me ask you how things have gone as far as you're concerned. Bible-wise, how's it been? 1985, have you retained anything? Have you spent enough time in there so she's beginning to stick? Have you retained anything as far as the Word of God's concerned? And then again, has it uh, been something you've declined from in 85? That you just pulled back. You're doing alright in 84, but 85 been a disaster for you. Oh, you don't want it to be that way. Turn it the other way, man. Finish it up good. And then again, what about the midst of your heart? The Bible says, let the, word of God, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. You know what that is? That's not just kind of, you know, here or there. But that's all the way down to the depths of your heart. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. You know what it takes? It takes diligence. There's a fellow running up and down this country. I suppose he's still doing it. His name's Jack Van Impey. I heard him preach. I think a lot of you have too. Jack Van Impey is what they call the walking Bible. And most people just marvel at Jack Van Impey because Jack Van Impey gets up there and he just starts in, you know, and he'll just talk verse after verse after verse after verse. That's, that's kind of a marvel and I appreciate what the guy's done, but I kind of like a lot of attention to go to the book. Not to the man, not to the mind, but to the book. Anyhow, Jack Van Impey, to do what he's done, memorize the New Testament and uh, some verses in the Old Testament, Jack Van Impey spends two hours every day. You say, reading the Word of God? He has to keep on going through the New Testament and he has to, I don't know where you call it, practice or what you'd call it, but he's got to keep on going through it two hours a day to retain it. 
You say, well, you don't have to do that. We've got a Bible we can turn to as long as we can turn to it. That's true. But by the same token, the fact remains that if you're going to keep your heart the way God wants it kept, clean, the Word of God will do that. Listen, if you're going to keep it the way the Word of God wants you to keep it, then you're going to have to spend some time day after day and be diligent in the Word of God or you'll never keep it. Keep it in the Word of God. Now the next thing about it is you need to keep it out of the world. You say, how can I do that? i got to live in the world. Well, they got a saying that puts it in a nutshell. You and I are in the world, not of the world. That does it. We do have to live in this world. As long as God gives us breath in this body, we've got to live in this world. Whenever God chooses to move us on up, that's entirely up to Him. But in the meantime, as long as we have life and breath and uh, being inside of our bodies, then you and I are in this present world. You say, well, why shouldn't I love this present world? I mean, uh, it's beautiful. Well, there's some beauties connected with it. I mean, the Lord took a look at everything that He made and it was good. Genesis chapter number 1, true. But the problem isn't what God made. And the problem isn't with what God made. The problem is with the fallen nature of man that has corrupted the good and perfect things that God has made and the good gifts that have come down from above have been corrupted by the nature of man. So much so that this world now is a far cry from what it was made. So much so that this world now, as the Bible says, it waxes old like a garment. It just like it's war plumb out. It just war slam out. You say, well, what make it do that? Answer is real simple. Evil. Take your Bible and go to Galatians chapter number 1. Paul gets talking about the world and he gets talking about this present world that you and I live in. That we live and move and have our being in. And this world in which you and I travel every day, you and I are not to be of the world. Our heart is not to be in the world. We're of, in the world, not of the world. But our heart is not to be in the world. We just live in this world. Here's the problem. In verse number 4 of Galatians chapter 1, Paul says, who gave himself for our sins and might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. You know what the problem is in this world? The problem is evil. The problem in this world is not that God didn't make it right. The problem is that the devil fell, caused Adam and Eve to fall. As a result, man is a fallen creature. That's the problem with this world. And even the earth now is under a curse. Genesis chapter number 4. And listen, my friend, you can be sure it's exactly like Paul said in his day. If it was that bad then, and things don't get better, they get worse until Jesus comes back. You can imagine what it must be like now. He said this present evil world. So the result is, Christian, don't get your heart in the world. You might have to live in this world. You might have to function in this world. You might have to operate in this world. But don't get your heart in the world. Whenever you get your heart in the world, you're going to find yourself being drawn into it, sucked into it. And you're going to find yourself not being spiritual and godly. You're going to find yourself being carnal and worldly. You will be a worldly Christian and well nigh worthless to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know you have to live in this world, and I know I've got to live in this world. I know there's certain things that I've got to do. I know I've got to go down to the store and get some groceries. And I know I can't just isolate myself off in some island somewhere and say, I don't want nothing to do with this world. I know that God has left me here. He left me here with a job and said, occupy till I come. It's not a matter of me trying to isolate myself and run and hide from the world. It's just that my heart is never to be drawn and taken in with this world. Now listen, one time back in the book of Hebrews, one of those saints I believe was Abraham. The Bible says if he is mindful of the country from whence he came up, from whence he came up, he might have had opportunity to have returned. He would have had, the Bible says. Do you know something? It says now he seeks a better country. You know the thing about it is this, my friend. If your heart is taken up by the world, if your mind, if your heart's taken up with it, your mind will be taken up with it, you'll find yourself right back in the old paths that you was in before you ever got saved and born again. You'll find yourself with your heart and your body and then your family in the world. And the world doesn't hold the blessings. It's God 
that holds the blessings. In the book of 1 John, the Bible says, The whole world lieth in wickedness. Now the Bible says in Colossians 3 and verse number 2, it says, Set thy affection on things above. Now if my heart is on another world, a world above, if my heart is on that world above, then my affection, not even affections, like I got one for this world and one for that world, it's like as though my affection... My affection, the affection of my heart is to be on the world above. You know, you get thinking about that world above and you get thinking about some beauties. You think about some beauties that haven't been tainted by sin. You think about some glories. You get thinking about some rewards up there. Our heart is supposed to be on another world. Not on this world here, but on the world above. Think about its pleasures up there. Somebody says, well, what are we going to be doing up there? The Bible says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Think about the joys that are up there. Sometimes down here we have some joy. But you know our joys down here... They're kind of like seesaw. And sometimes they run with seasons. Tis the season to be jolly. You know, and folks, this time of the year, sometimes a, a joy to the world type thing. But boy, you take about another, oh, another two weeks, and we're on the other side of all this, and uh, Higby's, O'Neill's, and Penny's haven't failed to get out their billing before the end of the month. And so as a result, the joy has come and gone. Uh, listen, if your joy is just, you know, up and down, up and down, runs with the seasons. Oh, listen, well, wouldn't heaven be wonderful just to have fullness of joy and not seasonal, not run with the seasons, not run with the trends, not be trendy, but I mean every day, day in, day out, pleasures even forevermore and fullness of joy. Not that, man, this is good, this is wonderful, but. I've heard so bad over here. I mean, it's going to be good. It's going to be wonderful. You and I, our affection is supposed to be in another world. You get thinking about the glories of heaven. You think about the glory of God. Why in Revelation chapter 21, the Bible speaks about New Jerusalem. And the Bible talks about the glory of God did lighten it. You get thinking about the glory of God. I get thinking about New Jerusalem up there and I get thinking about heaven. I get thinking about another world and I get thinking about a glorified body. I mean, the glory of God is one thing, but glorified bodies is still another thing. I get thinking about some of those bodies that you and I have had to sow in weakness. And the Bible says that one day those, those bodies will come forth with power. You say, man, I can't hardly believe that. By those bodies right now in a glorified body, those bodies knowing some uh, joy, knowing some power and strength that they've never known before. Sown in weakness, raised in honor. Sown in dishonor, raised in honor. Sown in weakness, raised in power. That which is weak, it gains some strength. Listen, my friend, when you and I think about a glorified body, you and I ought to get our heart on another world. And so it's important for a Christian, if he's going to keep his heart the way God wants it kept, his affection cannot be in this world, but his affection or her affection must be in another world, a world above. This one down here is an evil world, a present evil world, but the one above is one without any presence of evil. What about it, friend, when you stop and think about your heart, your attractions, your loves, the things that you desire most of all? Are they connected with heaven or are they connected with earth? Keep thy heart. Keep thy heart. Better watch it. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of advertising out there. Keep thy heart out of this world up there. Another thing I want to say about keeping your heart is this. As well as keeping your heart in the Word of God and out of the world, you have to keep your heart warm. You know, whenever you get thinking about that, why sometimes Christians' hearts become cold. And the more sin that you and I are around, whether we even want to be or not, some fellows on their job have to go through things that, thank God, I don't have to go through. But you know, whether you want to be or not, sometimes you're around certain things and you see a lot of sin, you're exposed to a lot of sin, and it causes your heart sometimes to want to grow cold. Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24, Because iniquity abounds, the love of many shall wax cold. When you think of that, it's a statement that wherever there's lots of sin on every hand, it seems like that it becomes kind of a way of life. It becomes kind of an accepted thing. And once it becomes a way of life and becomes an accepted thing, then next thing you know it becomes a thing that 
tends to want to lure the Christian. And you and I got to be real careful because once it tends to lure your heart, the next thing you know, your heart will be cold towards God and towards the Word of God, and especially towards the preaching of the Word of God. Last thing in the world you want is for somebody to get up here and preach to your heart and nail that thing. Brother, I mean, hit that nail right on the head and say, man, you had better keep your heart. You don't want it because your heart's done grown, grown cold. And where iniquity abounds, the love of many waxes cold. And a lot of times, it happens to a Christian. You need to keep your heart warm. Whenever a Christian's heart is warm, you can. Uh, it's just enjoyable being around them. They're fun to be around. They're enjoyable to be around. Why? Take your Bible. Look at Proverbs chapter fifteen. Proverbs fifteen. Look at verse number thirteen. Well, look at fifteen. Fifteen, fifteen. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. The indication is there are folks who every day. Uh, every day that they live, all the days, every day that they live, they just seem like they, they're just happy. They just rejoice. They have what is known as a merry heart. It's not December 25th we have a merry heart. All the days, all the days of the month, all the days of the year, all the days the afflicted are evil, ours are distinct, just the opposite. And you and I should have a merry heart every day of the year. Look at verse number 13, a merry heart. Make the cheerful countenance. Go to chapter 17 and verse number 22. Chapter 17, verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. You know what God wants you and I to do? He wants our hearts to be warm. He don't want us to be drawn towards sin to where our feelings towards the Word of God and towards God's people and towards the preaching of the Word of God are like it is outside. Icy, cold, chilly, I mean, cut you back. Did you ever get around somebody that just to be around them, just, there's just a chill there that, man, you know you are not wanted. Folks don't want you around. You're a threat. They don't enjoy you. They're afraid of what you might say. And boy, just like an iceberg out there. Well, listen, God certainly doesn't want a Christian to be that way. He certainly don't want a saved person to be that way. He wants you and I to enjoy our salvation. He wants you and I to enjoy each other. He wants you and I to even enjoy the Word of God. And the Word of God should be a delight to you and not a reproach unto you. You know what you need to do? You need to keep your heart warm all the days of your life. Winter time's just starting. You know, if you let circumstances control your heart, the condition of your heart, why, you'd get a cold heart and you'd get cold on God now. You'd stay cold on God all the way up to Easter. I mean, you know why some folks are uh, Christmas and Easter people? Because, I mean, they let things control their heart and they just kind of warm that thing up a little bit and get a little bit of joy at a certain time of the year. And then, no more all the way out to Easter time. And finally, as the spring breaks in, they, they finally kind of begin to warm up a little bit once again. Don't do that. Keep your heart warm. You know, whenever somebody has a warm heart, it's very, very attractive. It's most definitely attractive. It seems like whenever somebody has a warm heart, they're just pleasant to be around. They're, they've got that merry heart that has done them good like a medicine. It seems like their heart even does you good like a medicine. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And so the result is you just are attracted to someone like that. Down there where Paul took me hunting here a while back, this fell about a piece of ground. The house burned down. And so he uh, began to, on this piece of ground, he began to thought, well, first of all, I'll put up a barn. He put a barn up on that piece of ground and, and then uh, lost his job. So he thought, what do I do now? I've either got, either got to sell this place or I don't know what to do. And he thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll just sort of panel off a couple of sections of this barn here. And I will use the front part for the animals and the back part for me and the wife. And he paneled off the back part of that barn there and and uh, divide that thing up into a kitchen and a little room out there and a place to uh, sit. And he put a big old wood stove in that thing and a chimney stack out there. And uh, he put that thing up out of green timber. And about a year later, man, you could see there were some gaps the size. I mean, a half inch, three quarter inch gaps in that thing. He shoved stuff in there and he got that old wood burner cranked up and took the logs this time. And instead of slicing them up into lumber, he just took those things and, and he just stoked that old uh, wood stove. I was down there when that chill factor was minus 20 and that wind was blowing. And I stayed in that tree stand till a quarter of eight. And the thing about blew me out of it. And uh, man, I'll tell you what, it was a chilly willy out there on top of a hill in a tree stand, a quarter of six, and a chill factor of minus 20. 
And maybe I'm chicken and maybe I'm not a woodsman, but a quarter of eight I had it. And dear, no dear man, I couldn't do anything if I saw one. If he walked by, I'd have to watch him go. I didn't have enough. I couldn't do anything except, you know, stiffly get my gun up and maybe pull a trigger. But anyhow, I got down and you know where I went, man. I didn't go deeper in the woods. I headed for home base. I headed for home base and met Paul there. And uh, I met Paul there and he said, come on in. And I was going to his car, man. I was just going to get out of the wind and get in the car. He said, come on in. He said, why would you go in a place like that, man? Big old cracks. I mean, that wind comes sailing through there. Because they had that wood stove all stoked up. And because it was warm in there. And at 8.30 when Paul said, told his son, let's go. Man, I went from the kitchen to the stove. And I backed up to that stove like this. And man, I just was up back to that thing. Man, I just was like that. And I'll tell you what, I had to force myself to go back outside again. You know what I liked about that place? It was a barn. But it was livable. They're fixing to put up a nice house. And I'd probably be a daddy when they get it up. And they got the thing all pounded. They got the carpet in there. And they got the deer heads hanging in there. And they got everything a person could ask for in that place. But you know what attracted me to that place? I got deer heads of my own in a warm basement. You know what attracted me to that place? Was the warmth. You know what attracts people to you? Warmth. You know where that comes from? Your heart. Your heart determines whether it's a chill goes up or whether there's warmth that just seems to come out. I looked out of a lady's place yesterday, place of business, an upholstery place, and I said, is that a lake out there? <laughs> Felt silly after I said it. She said, no, the lake's this way. I said, out there. And she said, well, let me see. And then I took a better look, and it was the side of a hill. <laughs> oh, no. And she kind of excused it. She said, oh, it's probably the waves off this heater <laughs> going up, you know. <laughs> and uh, so... Yeah, anything warm, man, it's just, uh, I'll take it. Anything like that attracts me. It probably was really that heater. probably just drew me right to it, you know. But uh, one time the disciple said, did not our hearts burn within us? Why was that? I mean, tell me the hearts were just melted, burned within us? Why, you thought their hearts had been cold. Jesus had been crucified. That one that gave them power, that one that they had followed for three and a half years, he'd been crucified, buried, he'd done for! You say, their hearts should have been cold, but this did not our hearts burn within us? Yeah, they did. Why? Because that one who was crucified, buried, rose again, and was talking with them. While he talked with us by the way, and while he opened unto us the scriptures. You want to take to warm your heart up again? If your heart is growing cold towards God, you don't want to take my friend. Start talking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Start fellowshiping with Jesus Christ. Let Jesus talk back to you. Jesus won't mislead you. Jesus won't steer you wrong. Talk to the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll talk with you. And then not only that, he'll open to the word of God to you. And there's nothing sweeter than in all the world than for the word of God to be open to your heart. When He opens your eyes to the Word of God and opens your heart to the Scriptures, there's nothing to warm you up more in all this world than that will. You know what God wants you to do? God wants you to keep your heart warm. Now, you know something about your heart is I can't see your heart. I know faces here and I could probably call names of everybody in this church house here today. And uh, I can probably call names out of some that are missing, wondering why they're missing, and is their eye bottom, or they have a cold, or something else wrong. And you know, it's just that's just kind of the nature of a pastor. You just kind of wonder where folks is at, and and you know, you get known folks. But still, in this church house today, I do not know your heart. I could say, boy, that fellow, he's got a good heart. He's a good-hearted old soul. But I may be wrong. I know this. I know from the youngest to the oldest, I know for the teenagers, the young adults, I know, my friend, it's very important for you and I to learn this lesson and learn it well, that you and I can never let up on this matter of our heart, and you and I, even as far as just being warm, just being attractive, just having that which this world needs, and lost people need to lead them to Jesus Christ, you and I got to keep our heart warm. Last of all, you and I got to keep our heart in the work. Take your Bible and go back to Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 22 and verse number 23. 
Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 22. Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do heartily. Heartily, heartily. Heartily as to the Lord and not unto man. You know what you and I need to do? We need to keep our heart in the work. You know what you and I, we're liking unto a servant who has a master. The only thing about it is our master is in heaven. Our master is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you and I liken unto a servant unto him. You and I liken unto a bond slave unto him. And the things that you and I do, we do primarily, number one, we do for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what a servant is? He's someone who has some service to offer. According to Colossians chapter 3, he's one who will serve and serve well and serve willingly and serve and do the, his very best and do it with singleness of heart because there's no master like his master. And you and I, we've got a master and there's no master like our master. And you, you and I should have service like nobody else has, my friend to offer for the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I ought to put our heart and keep our heart in the work of God. You know, I've already been in restaurants already where someone has served me. I don't always go to McDonald's and Gyro Kings or wherever the fast food places are. Uh, Sometimes I go to Frank's. And sometimes I go down to Amish country. And sometimes uh, other places. I've gone in places where I've had somebody come and serve me and I thought to myself, you phony you, you don't care nothing about me. You don't care whether I have water or don't have water. You don't care if I have coffee or don't have coffee. You're so phony. All you care about is whether you get a dime for a tip. Do they give dime tips anymore? I don't know. They wouldn't, that wouldn't even be enough tip for a cup of coffee. What? I don't know. But anyhow, sometimes you see them that way and sometimes Christians is that way. Sometimes they can't do it without having another motive. Sometimes they can't serve just because they're no master like they've got, nobody like they've got, knowing one day they'll get a reward on the other side and serve with singleness of heart, whether they're seen or not seen. Uh, they don't have to argue with Him. They obey. They're not arguing. Say, why do I have to do this? Why don't you give someone else that job? I'd like to have that job. That's an easier job. I'd rather have that job. There's more glory to that job. I don't want the job you've given to me. Listen, that servant that has his heart in the work, in his master's work, he don't care what the job is. He don't care if it's seen. He don't argue about the job. He does the job. He's got his heart in the work. I've learned a long time ago that I fare better in trying to keep things going in a church with folks who may not have all the talent and capabilities of another person, but whose heart is in your work. They can be trained. Besides that, mistakes get by if they're a mistake of the head and not the heart. And folks who have their heart in the work will be diligent. They'll be there week after week and service after service. You can count on them for anything. And you know something? Just as our heart ought to be in our work here that God has given us, not only that, even greater than that, our heart should be in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I ought to be doing our utmost without arguing, without needing to be seen and recognized and acknowledged every time we make a move. You and I are likened unto servants with a greater master up in heaven. We don't serve because somebody down here sees us. The Bible says, not with eye service, but in singleness of heart. The Bible says, serving the Lord. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Not half-heartily. Put your heart into it. What you do for the Lord Jesus Christ, you do from the depths of your heart. You do it as good as you can do it. You go at that thing full blast. You pray over that thing. You put your heart into the work that God has called you and I to do. You do what you can do. You do it right. You pay the price. But you do it heartily. Now Christian, the Bible says if your heart is kept out of it are the issues of life. The things you do, I won't have to run you around, won't have to bird dog you, follow you around and say, no, no, hold it. I won't have to give you a bunch of no-nos and yes-yeses. The things you do will be the things that God wants you to do if you'll keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. You keep your heart in the Word of God so that your heart retains it and doesn't decline from it. So that's in the midst of your heart. You keep your heart in the Word and out of the world 
It's an evil world. Ultimately, evil is going to cost you, curse you. It's going to cost you and your family. Keep it out of the world. Keep it in another world, that which is above. Christian, keep your heart warm. It's cold out there. Even in Christianity, there's a lot of formality and ritual. There's nothing can minister to people like a warm heart. There's absolutely nothing that will do the job quite like a warm heart. And then, Christian, keep your heart in the work that God has given you to do. Don't argue. Don't get yourself on such a childish basis that you have to be acknowledged for everything and you have to have an audience before you do anything. But my friend, you do it because you've got the greatest master anyone could ever have, the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's in heaven. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Bow for prayer. Father, we're thankful now for the Word of God. And Lord, one more time, I want to just try to preach this verse, Lord, or try to already. And Lord, I want the Christians to think on these four areas. And I realize there are lots and lots of ways I could talk along these lines. And I've done it in times past other ways. But God, today, help me think this way. Lord, their heart's supposed to be in the Word. And God, not in the world. And Lord, their heart's supposed to be warm. And God, their heart is supposed to be in the work that you've called them to do. And sometimes, Lord, we tend to get wore out with routines and rituals and or not rituals, but just the regular everyday things that we are called upon to do. Lord, sometimes we feel like it, it becomes a drag. And Lord, help us not to feel that way. Help us to put our heart into it every day, knowing that one day there's a reward on the other side and some of them even in this life. Father, I pray you might speak to the hearts of the Christian. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.